we can uh, go to the last speaker uh, of the third day of ARDD. It's almost a shame that we're already at the end. Chris Verburg, are you there, Chris? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Fantastic. Great. Whenever you are ready, you can share your, uh, your slides, and we very much look forward to your presentation. Great, excellent, thank you. So normally you should be able to see my slides, so. Uh... Yes, looks perfect. Go ahead. Excellent. Great, thank you. So hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for being here and um, very happy to give this brief introduction into some interesting technologies uh, that can enable us to live longer, healthier lives. Uh, my name is Christopher Burke. Um, I'm a medical doctor by training. And since a young age, I've been fascinated by uh, the aging process, longevity, and novel biotechnologies. So for the next uh, 20 minutes, I would be happy to briefly guide you through some interesting technologies. Uh, using as a guideline some companies or specific technologies we have invested in as the Longevity Vision Fund. And uh, as you probably are all very well aware of, we are at the, at the beginning of a new era for longevity. And that's mainly driven by three uh, important developments. And the first of those three is that we are, of course, at the beginning of a new biotech revolution. And I like to draw the parallel between the first and the second biotech revolution, as I call them. First biotech revolution mainly involved um, specific small drugs, surgery and vaccines. And still a lot of medicine still works that way with these uh, specific treatment modalities. Then, of course, the second biotech revolution developed very quickly, uh, very recently, in fact. And uh, we are at the beginning of this, this new biotech uh, development where we see the advent of all kinds of new uh, fascinating therapies that can really make a substantial difference uh, in, in the health of, of patients. So we are speaking of gene editing, transcriptomic drugs, epigenetic therapies, immunotherapy, and so on. So these new technologies are great tools to not just treat diseases, but specifically also aging-related diseases and perhaps in a more further future aging itself. Then a second important development is the realization that aging causes, in fact, all aging-related diseases. Uh, so it's still uh, uh, something I'm, I'm a bit preaching to the choir because a lot of people in the audience know that the same processes that cause aging are very important processes also in Alzheimer's disease or heart disease and so on. But still, we need to educate more uh, medical doctors and policymakers and governments about this but the best way to keep people healthy and to substantially reduce the risk of all these diseases is by treating aging itself, by going at the root cause of these diseases. But this paradigm shift is happening. It's unfolding slowly but steadily. And then a third important development is the realization in specifically the aging field that it's not just about slowing down aging, but actually even reversing it. Uh, we have seen in the past years that it's possible to partially reverse aging, whether through epigenetic reprogramming or, or through uh, clearance of senescent cells and so on. And what these and other studies show us is that it's possible to uh, make an old organism uh, younger again, uh, both uh, phenotypically and physiologically speaking. And so it's not anymore just about slowing down um, the aging process, but actually uh, partially reversing also aging. So these three interesting developments uh, paved the way for a, a fund like the Longevity Vision Fund. We, we thrive in this, in this beginning of, of this new era of opportunities. And our fund, it's a $100 million fund that invests into new technologies to address aging. Uh, we are a bit different uh, compared to other funds, and I will come back uh, to that very quickly, um, in the sense that we just not only invest in pure hallmarks of aging, uh, technologies, so not just only in pure aging companies, but we also invest in many other technologies. As you can see uh, on your screen, uh, we have like specific investment pillars. We invest in preventive medicine and early detection. A second pillar is focused on longevity therapies and regenerative medicine. We also invest in medtech, AI, healthcare infrastructure, and so on. So everything essentially that can help us to live longer, healthier lives. Like I said, we are a bit different than a pure longevity fund on itself in the sense that we not just focus on aging, but also on novel biotechnologies. 
that can be used then to uh, not just to uh, a lot of these technologies are used to treat aging related diseases or sometimes different aging uh, or different diseases, but also these technologies in in a further in a future further down can also be used uh, to address uh, aging itself. And to give you some example of these novel biotechnologies, we find very interesting. Uh, one example is uh, gene therapy and gene editing. It's one uh, we are looking at all kinds of different technologies uh, to uh, to address this. And as you very well know, uh, gene editing started around uh, 2012 with the discovery of CRISPR-Cas9. And um, CRISPR-Cas9, of course, has uh, created a stage for the for all kinds of interesting companies like editors, CRISPR, Intelli, and so on. But uh, often this is called gene editing 0.1 technology in the sense that, of course, CRISPR-Cas9 is, is already very interesting and very promising and uh, transformative, but there are some uh, drawbacks. So it makes uh, uh, double-strand breaks, so you have to use PAM sequences. And then it's, not, it's very good at um, disrupting genes, uh, uh, but not very good at uh, inserting novel genes or specific gene sequences. So with that in mind, we have seen the advent of gene editing 2.0 approaches like base editors. Uh, they don't uh, have to make uh, double strand breaks and they can change one specific base at a time, which is enough to cure thousands of diseases that are caused by uh, point mutations, for example. And this is also a quite elegant uh, method, of course. Uh, another example of gene editing um, approaches is uh, prime editing. Uh, where uh, this technology is much better at inserting specific sequences into the genome uh, using a reverse transcriptase. Uh, and uh, this is also, of course, very promising. And uh, we are, as, a, as an investment fund, looking in what we call also gene editing 3.0 uh, approaches, which are, for example, technologies like uh, transposons. Uh, so one of the companies we invested in is Tessara. And they are uh, creating or developing novel kinds of transposons. Um, uh, as, as a refresher, there are two kinds of transposons, DNA transposons and RNA transposons. The DNA transposons are uh, made by nature very well equipped to, in fact, uh, cut out a specific DNA sequence, which is here depicted in uh, pink and through transposases. And these transposases, which are these uh, uh, orange uh, dots, they can uh, insert the uh, specific DNA sequence back into uh, the genome. Uh, then, of course, you have RNA transposons that work a bit differently. So the DNA uh, sequence of the transposon is uh, uh, transcribed um, into uh, RNA, and then the RNA is reverse transcribed yeah, again into DNA and inserted somewhere differently. Uh, also plays a role in aging, of course, because these RNA transposons, they can make copies of themselves and inject them uh, everywhere in, the, in our genome, which could also contribute to aging. But these technologies are very interesting because they are very well in, uh, very well capable of inserting specific sequences into the genome. Um, so you can look, for example, at DNA transposons, where you would uh, use these transposases with a specific DNA sequence uh, to in inject or insert that specific DNA sequence into the genome. Or you can use uh, retrotransposons, as you can see here in the depiction, you see here uh, the reverse transcriptase uh, working in fact, so uh, at in creating uh, from an RNA strand which latches onto the DNA at a specific C, uh, location, and then the reverse transcriptase uh, tr translates this RNA strand into a DNA strand that then um, is completely inserted into the genome, which is of course very interesting. And uh, that would enable all kinds of uh, interesting uh, applications, of course, because if you can insert much larger sequences of genetic material in the genome, um, that uh, paves the way for all kinds of gene therapies, not to uh, only cure uh, specific diseases, but to address aging. Uh, I'm, I'm just uh, giving some examples how this could go about, but you can, for example, using gene editing 3.0, zero therapies to insert combinations of genes, um, to insert multiple gene copies, uh, or to insert uh, exceptional genes that are associated with um, a very long lifespan or substantial reduction in all kinds of diseases. And I will give a quick example of each of these possibilities. Uh, for example, in, in this study, we see that combinations of different genes often works much better. Uh, as you can see on the right, 
Uh, you see the, the heart muscle. Um, this is um, a cross section of heart muscle tissue, and you see a 70% improvement in cardiac function compared to the control group. It's see by combining two genes. If you insert or transduce cells or, uh, or organisms with only one gene, the effect is much less. Uh, same as you can see at the bottom. So the C is the control group uh, or the control kidneys. And you can see on the right, for example, that uh, inserting two genes um, led to 75% reduction in uh, kidney atrophy in this specific experimental setup uh, compared to just uh, to compare to the control group, but you can also see that just in inserting one gene is not making a big difference, but uh, combining two genes has a substantial synergistic effect, which should not be surprising given uh, how nature and cells, of course, work. You could also use these novel gene editing technologies to insert multiple copies to extend lifespan or uh, substantially reduce risk of cancer, for example. We know that big uh, animals like whales or elephants, they have a uh, much lower uh, risk of getting cancer. And one way to do this is by having multiple copies of P53 in their genome, which is an important uh, protein involved in, in uh, um, DNA damage responses and reducing the risk of uh, cancer. Or you could use uh, these novel gene editing technologies to introduce specific genes into the genome that are conferred with substantial reduction of risk of specific diseases. Um, uh, one company is still using a, uh, more uh, CRISPR 0.1 approaches, but still they want to, for example, uh, tweak a gene and try to create a mutation, a very rare mutation that confers 80% less risk of getting a heart attack in the in the specific uh, individuals that are lucky enough to have this mutation. And it would be, of course, great if we could introduce these kinds of uh, gene variants. Um, uh, in, our, in, in the population to treat um, uh, specific heart disease or substantially reduce the risk of heart disease. And of course, you need to get all these new gene editing tools into the cells. And as a fund, we are also looking in all kinds of carriers or uh, carrier modalities to, lo uh, to, put, uh, to load up these carriers with these novel gene editing technologies. Um, all kinds of companies are working on that. They're trying to uh, look into specific viral vectors, for example, they, that they um, create through directed evolution and AI uh, to create much more effective viral vectors that are much better to trans uh, able to transduce cells or are less immunogenic or cause less inflammation and so on. Uh, one of the companies we invested in is 4DMT, which creates uh, libraries for, of up to 1 billion uh, different variants of a uh, specific viral vector. Uh, they use AI and also they test uh, their models in animals and they uh, test multiple uh, viral vectors at the same time to select for the best viral vectors uh, to create uh, much more successful uh, carriers to deliver all this gene editing machinery or to deliver genes themselves into, um, into our own uh, cells. And of course, I'm speaking of AI because AI is an important tool also in, in, uh, in creating, for example, viral vectors. And as a, as a fund, we, of course, invest also and look uh, deeply into AI uh, capabilities. So an example of one of the companies we invested in is Velo Health, which uh, um, gathers trillions of different data points to discover uh, new drugs. They, can have, they also have the capability to quickly synthesize these drugs in their lab and automatize uh, all kinds of uh, um, processes in the lab to very quickly test uh, specific uh, sub substances and compounds and iterate on, on their specific uh, discoveries. And of course, these trillions of data points, they come from, from all kinds of different, um, let's say, um, data sets. Um, and of course, if we think about health and, and uh, the human data set uh, as, as, as well, the big uh, chemical uh, example is our genome. But we, of course, know that there are many other ohms. Uh, this is the epigenome, transcriptome, microbiome, proteome, and so on. So companies like Velo, they look at uh, multiple ohms and, of course, at many other um, data sources like uh, clinical trials, uh, uh, chemical uh, uh, data sources, epidemiological uh, data sources, uh, health records, and so on. But I give this example of this panomics approach because still in medicine, we often think only in the context of the genome, uh, trying to unravel genes that are involved in longevity and uh, trying to assess your risk of heart disease and, and obesity uh, through looking at the genome, at specific genes. 
But that has been a very big disappointment uh, because we know that there are extra layers of complexity. It's not just the genome, it's the epigenome, transcriptome, and so on. And we see, for example, that the best uh, clocks to assess our biological age are, for example, epigenetic clocks and not uh, genomic clocks. Um, so this is a bit of a paradigm shift that's also happening in the medical field. We have to look at this panomic approach and, of course, need AI and cloud computing to store all this data to enable much more effective predictive and personal uh, and preventative treatments and therapies. I put preventative in red as a color because uh, I uh, believe that prevention is, is uh, tremendously important and will become ever more important. So it's, of course, much better to prevent diseases than trying to create all these technologies to treat diseases when it's already too late. So as a fund, we also, of course, invest in all kinds of uh, preventative medicine approaches. One of our inv investments is a company called Phenome, which can detect cancer by just uh, looking at your blood. So uh, you go to the doctor in the future and you just draw some blood and, and in the blood, um, uh, there is looked at specific signatures of cancer, which is very interesting because most cancer is detected way too late. Uh, often through medical imaging. And uh, if you can see the cancer through medical imaging, the cancer is already often way too big. And uh, of course, uh, the sooner you can detect cancer, uh, you have an exponential, exponential increase in, uh, in, in chance of, of, of uh, good recovery compared to when the cancer is detected too late. Companies like Freenome are interesting because they just not only look at circulating tumor DNA, which is a bit like looking at a needle in a haystack because there's a lot of DNA circulating in the bloodstream anyhow from cells that die off and so on. So, but they also look at epigenetic signatures, proteins, peptides, uh, transcriptomics, and, and so on. And uh, they use AI to make sense of all these data inputs um, to track down cancer much faster. Um, and there are even like tests already available. Like a few weeks ago, this test was launched. It's called Gallery. And it looks at uh, 50 different types of cancer to try to detect them by just uh, drawing blood. Um, they say the specificity is almost 100%, uh, which is good. It means that uh, if, if, you, um, yeah, if something shows up, it's very likely you do have a problem. So it's not going to worry a lot of uh, people uh, uh, with, uh, that are healthy. But the problem is uh, the sensitivity is not perfect yet. Uh, so they say 89%, but uh, it's about 76% sensitivity for about two-thirds of, uh, of the most lethal cancers. And for some cancers, it's even lower. But it's the beginning of a new era where you just go to your medical doctor, you get some blood round, and uh, cancer will be detected in phase uh, one or stage two or even stage zero. So uh, uh, that uh, is, of course, very interesting. Then, of course, we also invest in medtech devices uh, because preventive medicine is not just about diagnostic tests, but also at creating specific devices that can help doctors and uh, patients to much um, uh, sooner detect problems and, and uh, diseases. We invested, for example, in EcoSmart stethoscopes that can use AI to analyze um, uh, your heart rhythm, for example, is ACG uh, results or your heart murmurs to diagnose uh, specific problems in the heart. Um, we also invested in EXO, which creates uh, handheld ultrasound devices. Um, and uh, there's also this uh, application of AI that uh, can analyze these ultrasound images to diagnose uh, specific uh, diseases. And of course, this plays into this revolution or uh, evolution that we are seeing. Like not until so long ago, an uh, ultrasound device was a very bulky device that you had to roll around and that cost uh, uh, between 20 and 200 thousand dollars. Then you have companies like EXO creating these handheld ultrasound devices. And we will go to a future where patients just stick it on their body like a patch or where um, it's integrated in clothing or uh, in your smartwatch or uh, bracelets and so on. And that's, of course, very interesting uh, because you can then track your health at home. And this evolution will also enable much better preventive medicine and continuous more personalized uh, medicine. And uh, we see this also in many other companies uh, where, for example, a smartphone is converted into a diagnostic tool where, uh, for example, a smartphone can be used to analyze your voice to predict your risk of heart disease, Parkinson's disease, depression. Or imagine you, fall, you feel to start sick and you start to cough. So your smartphone could analyze the sound of your cough and determine whether this cough is caused by uh, asthma or bronchitis or pneumonia and so on. There are also other companies working on uh, you, 
making use of your uh, camera and your smartphone, your selfie camera, for example, um, that could track your eye movements to predict your risk of cognitive decline. And there are also companies that are looking into, for example, uh, using AI to track your swiping behavior to also diagnose psychiatric disorders or dementia. Um, so imagine in the future, after you use your phone, message like, um, we, we have seen that you're at an increased risk of getting Alzheimer's disease within 10 years. Uh, please contact you where uh, we're heading towards. Then, of course, besides these technologies, another example of technologies we invest in are organ and tissue regeneration. An example is Sigilon. That's uh, encapsulating specific cells uh, so that they are protected from the immune system. And then the cells are, uh, and capsules are injected in the abdominal cavity where, it, where they can stay for six months uh, or longer, which is very interesting because with a big problem with cell therapy is that if you inject these, uh, these cells, uh, they are often, um, uh, the immune system gets rid of them, which is far from ideal and they often not graft very well. We also invested in companies like, like Genesis that are injecting liver cells uh, into lymph nodes to grow uh, livers inside those lymph nodes. Uh, so you have like an extra organ and uh, these liver cells know when to stop growing, uh, when they sense that the blood is filtered and, uh, and clean, cleansed enough, uh, which could be very interesting um, to postpone the need for liver transplantations um, altogether even. And this plays into this development where organs are grown, for example, in bioreactors, or ideally in humans or even animals like some other companies are also doing. And of course, finally, we are also investing in pure aging companies. Um, so one of our investments is in live biosciences, which is a company that looks at fundamental aging processes um, and uh, like mitochondrial coupling or uh, autophagy inducement. Um, and there are of course many other uh, specific aging targets or technologies uh, that we are looking into uh, as a fund and that are of course very promising and all kinds of companies are looking into uh, approaches to mitigate these more fundamental aging processes and uh, hopefully at the same time reduce substantially the risk of, uh, of these diseases or even uh, partially reverse them. And even large companies like Google are, uh, or Alphabet are realizing that the best way to keep people healthy is by uh, targeting uh, the root cause of these diseases, which is aging itself. So we have like a bit of uh, two approaches towards this new uh, biotech and longevity uh, revolution. You have people who are, who are very optimistic and that think that these new technologies will enable us to live much, much longer than uh, what would be the biological plateau of our species, which would be around 120 years. But if we could uh, partially reverse aging or substantially slow down the aging process, we could perhaps uh, uh, push through that plateau of 120 years. And then there are scientists with more uh, subdued uh, visions uh, saying that, well, it's just great that uh, the paradigm shift is unfolding um, in the sense that the best way to keep people healthy is by uh, targeting aging itself. And I would be like, as a medical doctor, be very happy if the second uh, quote would come to fruition already so that uh, we, uh, in fact, can keep people healthier for longer by going uh, at uh, the root cause aging itself. So in conclusion, I can say, yeah, as, uh, as I already explained in the beginning of my talk, we are at the beginning of a biotech revolution with all kinds of fascinating new technologies coming finally at the disposal of scientists and medical doctors um, to much better treat uh, diseases, but also to much better treat aging. And addressing aging is the best way to keep people healthy for as long as possible because we go at the root cause of so many aging-related diseases. And the health and longevity industry will be the biggest industry in the future. Everyone wants to stay healthier um, and uh, substantially reduce the risk of all kinds of aging-related diseases. So it's in this context that I very uh, much look forward to the next years and decades to come and uh, to follow up closely with these new developments. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chris. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Chris, people are very thirsty here and uh, very much wanting to go to the bar. Can you give like a two, one, one minute answer to what uh, particularly excites you 
if for all of the stuff you've picked out, what one thing is what you feel is most exciting? Yeah, it's difficult because all kinds of very fascinating technologies in development. Um, I think for, for now, I would uh, think the new gene editing modalities are very fascinating. So ways to uh, much better treat, uh, uh, insert new gene sequences and so on. Uh, I think that's a very uh, powerful technology. And secondly, uh, epigenetic treatments. I think epigenetic treatments are a very elegant approach of not having to cut into the genome like uh, with CRISPR-Cas9, but to uh, impact uh, the gene uh, translation just uh, through epigenetic mechanisms. Um, and probably there are many reasons why we age, but uh, we've seen a lot of studies that this epigenetic dysregulation plays a very important role in aging. And that if you uh, re epigenetically reprogram organism, you uh, cure or reverse all kinds of aging hallmarks uh, like mitochondrial DNA, uh, damage or even DNA damage or accumulation of protein. All these kinds of damage can be solved by epigenetic reprogramming or at least to a substantial degree. So I think new technologies to change the epigenome, whether through changing methylation patterns or changing the histonylation, or even at a higher level, we also looked into companies to change even the chromatin organization. Um, I think that that's very promising uh, also to uh, treat uh, aging processes and aging related diseases. That's great. Thank you so much, Chris. It was a really interesting talk. Uh, let's give him another round of uh, applause. Thank you.